Amen. Okay, how's everybody doing? I like that. I like that. As you guys can see, Pastor Todd, Pastor Tammy, they are out tonight. Um, they are taking a trip with the bishop of the conference, the Appalachian Conference, and it's the bishop's board and the women's ministry board, I believe. Um, they are all taking a trip to, to go to Holmes, which is an IPHC college. They're going to uh, Emmanuel, which is an IPHC college, and they're, they're doing this tour, which is really cool, and so really cool that they're able to go and, and to do that. And so um, now we're going to do our tithes and offering really quick. Uh, I forgot that I had to do this part as well, so I don't really have much prepared, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep it simple tonight and keep it simple to the fact of, of knowing that when you tithe, when, when you put your money in the offering, when you sow into this ministry, you are sowing a seed. It's that simple. You're sowing a seed, and, and it's harvest time right now. We were talking about um, harvesting pumpkins and all the stuff that's going on. And, you know, if I'm not a farmer, but if I put in, we'll just say, I don't know, gr you know, green beans, tomatoes, if I put some seed in there, if I put some plant a tomato plant, I shouldn't expect to harvest a pumpkin, right? So when you're sowing into the ministry, you want to, to sow it deep. You want to sow it cheerfully. You want, to, you want to get it in there. You don't want to leave it near the surface so you can try to pick it back up. You know, go in with it with a cheerful heart, a thankful heart that God has allowed you to have the opportunity, given you the finances to sow into the ministry, and I know that he will bless you for it. So let's pray real quick. Um, God, we just thank you for this ministry. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time where we come together and, and worship you and, and this opportunity to, to worship you with our, with our tithes and our finances. And we pray that you would just bless the giver and, and, and bless the, the ministry. And uh, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
like a, a love song, like if the rocks cry out, silence, so will I. You know, you, if the wind and waves obey you, so will I. But it's also kind of challenging, right? If you gladly chose surrender, so will I, will you? If the wind and waves obey you, so will I, will you? If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. Will you? I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves because it's, it's great to get emotional and, and to feel this song and to feel in your spirit and think, yes, God, yes, God. But to put it into practice is a whole different thing. And it kind of touches on what I want to speak to you guys tonight. And I'm, I'm thankful they played that song because we didn't even talk about that. But um, isn't he a good God? Give him a hand clap. So like I said earlier, um, I'm filling in for Pastor Todd or Pastor Tammy. We're excited that they're on, the tr on their trip that they are, the things that they're doing, the places that God has, has taken them, and the opportunities that he's given them. I think it's exciting, and I think it's awesome. And um, I was really, you know, happy and, and excited about the opportunity to come and speak to you guys again tonight. And I spent a lot of time just, like, thinking and praying and wondering and, like, God, what do you want me to say? What do you what do you want me to speak? What do you want me to do? You know, I, in business, I don't mind having team meetings or board presentations or things like that. I I can do that. But when it comes to the word of God, like that's some pressure. That's some pressure. <laughs> because you know, it's one thing if a business is what we're talking about, but when it's souls at stake, when it's people at stake, that takes it to a whole nother level. And so never think for a second that your pastors don't put a lot of time and prayer into the things that they present to you guys because it's, it's, um, it's, it's I wouldn't say it's a burden, but it's, it's pressure to do that and, uh, and also an opportunity to do that. And so I was, I was going over and over trying to think about what I was going to say, what I was going to do, and um, I told Montana, I was like, I, she, she said, do you have a message yet? Have you figured it out? I'm like, no, I don't. Scratch that one off the list. I'm going to the bedroom. I'm going to pray and play some worship music. Let's see if I can get something. A couple hours later, have you got anything yet? No, scratch that one off the list. And this kept going on and on. And I finally got to the point where I was like, you know what? I've listened, you know, I normally listen to a sermon a day, if you will, while I'm driving and things like that. And I write down notes and take notes. And I thought, you know, I'm sure I've heard something lately that I can take and build on. Not to take someone else's message, but maybe some key principles that I could also talk about. And I feel like God spoke to me and said, you got to go to war, got to go to battle with the weapons that I've given you. And I think about, you know, King David, or before he was king, when he killed Goliath, and how he didn't go into battle with Saul's armor or with his, with his sword. He went in with what God had given him. It may be smooth stones, but you got to go with what God's given you, right? And so as I was praying that, I, I said, okay, God, that's what I'll do. And I flipped out my phone. And I keep notes to myself, different things that I'm thinking of or that God's revealing to me. And, and I started searching, and I came across um, a dream that I had in December of 2017, a dream that I had forgotten about, but it was principles that I was already putting into place. And so I felt immediately that that's what God wanted me to share with you guys. I hope that you can't hear me swallow through this. 
And so the dream was I am, I, I, was, I was in a maze, and it was a big maze. And I'm going through, and I'm bumping into this door, and I have to backtrack. And I'm going through, and I think I'm on the right path, and bam, meeting another wall, another door. And I keep doing this. And it's this huge, huge maze. And in doing that, I felt like God revealed to me something. And he said, I want to give you the keys. If you would seek me, if you would pursue me, if you would come closer to me, I want to give you keys that will unlock these doors. Otherwise, you're going to keep bumping into to dead ends and not go anywhere. And I continued praying on that, and, and I felt like the first key that, um, that God had revealed to me was self-discipline. That sounds like an exciting topic, right? Like, I saw you guys, you know, you got excited when I said that, self-discipline. Um, that's not something people like to talk about, right? We don't like self-control. We don't like self-discipline. You didn't like it when you were a kid. You didn't like it when mom or daddy got, you know, disciplined you. You probably don't like it or didn't like it as a parent. You know, I always heard my parents say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but you know, as a parent, I can understand that concept now. And so we don't like to talk about those things. And um, as, an, as adults, we try to avoid it. We don't want to be in trouble with our boss or if our, with our spouse or whatever. And it's not something that we like to, like, that we like to talk about. And my, the first scripture I want to point out is Hebrews twelve eleven, And this is where God is talking, the scripture is talking about how God disciplines his children, us as his children, how we still receive discipline. And it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It's important to have this tool in your arsenal um, to be able to Uh, avoid things that you should avoid and and not do things that you shouldn't do, right? Um, Self-discipline, self-control are very important, and I like to think of them as kind of like a a one-two punch, where combined together, they are a force. And um, though they're they're different, people kind of group them as as the same. Self-control is more of a short-term activity, uh, short stops, urges. So you think about... um, Let's see, think about like desserts. You know, maybe you, you want to get trimmer. Maybe like as Pastor Todd says, you want to avoid the hinky dinks and things. And so, you know, self-control would be, I'm not going to take this donut. Self-discipline would say, I'm going to eat vegetables from now on. Or I'm going to work out in the morning. So as a one-two punch, it's kind of like, okay, first punch is I avoided the donut. Second punch is I worked out in the morning so that you're getting further along in your progress. It's a one-two punch. For an example, your first punch could be your self-control is these ladies or men that I'm with are gossiping. I'm going to not gossip. I'm not going to say anything. Self-control, keep your mouth shut. Self-discipline would say when that happens next time, I'm going to walk away or I'm going to put some places, parameters in my life where I avoid those situations altogether. Self-control could be I'm not going to click on this website that I click on sometimes. I'm not going to drink this thing that I drink sometimes. Self-discipline would say, I'm going to put, put a plan in place where I read the Bible at this time when I would normally do this other thing. It's a one-two punch. So that together they create a force. Um, I wanted to go over some definitions real quick. The definition of self-discipline is the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses. The ability to pursue what one thinks is right despite temptations to abandon it. Self-control, similar, is the ability to control one's emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations. To me, I think this topic is so important because if you dial it all the way back to Genesis, you would see that if Eve could have had a little bit of self-control, self-discipline, if Adam could have had some self-control to say, you know, I'm not going to eat that fruit, This whole thing could have been different, right? So it's one of the foundational principles in my mind of of what we need to do in our lives to get where God wants us to go. Um, In Titus 1.8, this is scripture talking about who is eligible to be an elder in the church. And it says, rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Both of them. 
self-control, self-discipline. They kind of go together. And so throughout this message, I'm going to kind of use them a little bit interchangeably, not interchangeably, but use them grouped together. So it's, it's the ability to forego immediate pleasure for the exchange of long-term results. It's choosing actions that are in your best interest. Um, I read a quote, or I heard a quote from Joel Olstein that said, if we live a lazy, undisciplined life, if we give in to our emotions, we will act on emotional impulses and make very poor choices that we regret later on. And then maybe you've been there, or maybe you know someone who has made a choice that has stuck with them for the next 20 years. They clicked a website, they took a drink, they smoked something, or whatever you want to think about, and it changed the whole course of their life, you could say. And if they had been able to, to have the self-control to push that away or to not do it, if they had been disciplined enough in their pursuit of God that they, that they didn't even get in those positions, um, their whole life could be completely different. Um, and it's something that uh, I think is prevalent in our society. You know, we, we gen- generally go along with the crowd. We like to do what's fun, what's cool. Um, we, we like immediate satisfaction. And um, they say, you know, sin feels good, right, at the time. And so that's what, we, that's what we go with. We want the microwave results. We want what makes me feel good right now. We're not good at disciplining ourselves so that we can look down the road and have what we would really want to have long term. And so um, if I'd have thought about this ahead of time, I could have bought you guys a bag of keys or something. Because in my mind, like, just like in my dream, I feel like God is saying that this is one of the keys to living your fulfilled, your fulfilled potential in Christ. And I heard a story one time. There was a pastor, Miles Monroe, who's passed away now. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he was, he was giving a sermon. It was in Seattle, Washington. And he was, say, he was saying to the, to the people that he, um, that he, on the way to, to preach, he passed by the richest place in the world. And people were like, what are you talking about? He said, this place is richer than anything I've ever seen. It's, it's richer than the oil fields in the east or in Texas. It's richer than uh, the diamond mines in, in South Africa. It's richer than, than Silicon Valley, if you will. It's richer than any place you've ever seen. And people are like questioning, thinking, what is this guy talking about? And he finally says, the richest place I've ever seen is a graveyard. And the reason that's the richest place I've ever seen is because there are so many God-sized dreams, God-sized callings that never came to fruition, books that were never written, songs that were never sung, inventions that were never invented, businesses that were never started. They're lying there in the graveyard, and that is the richest place I've ever seen. How many people in here would like to fulfill their potential in Christ? the calling that God has given them. I'd hope everyone would, right? We all want to fulfill. Every single one of you in here has a calling on your life from God. And I know that you'd want to fulfill that, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight. And so that's my prayer, is that each and every one of us would do that. So as always, it seems, I have four key takeaways, uh, four topics, four titles, if you will, um, of different things that I feel God has given me about self-discipline, self-control. Number one is that self-discipline, self-control is sourced from the Holy Spirit. You know, we talk a lot around here about big boy pants and big girl pants and pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and all of that is true. You have to do that in many, many situations for sure. This is not necessarily one of them. Now, don't get me wrong. You have a lot to do on your part as well. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians to take every thought captive. So you have the ability to do that. However, we can read in 2 Timothy 1, 7. And this is out of the New Living Translation. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So the, I think the King James Version says sound mind. The NIV, I believe, says self-control. So you can see how they kind of go together. But right there we see that God did not give us a spirit of fear. No, he gave us a spirit 
of self-control, a spirit of self-discipline, a spirit to be able to, to turn down those things that we know aren't of God but might give us some immediate satisfaction. We can turn those things to the side because we can see long-term where God wants to take us, right? And so we have the discipline to achieve those things by turning down the, the immediate results. Galatians 5, 23. It says, But the spirit of love... I'm sorry, but the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, goodness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, we see it right there that the Spirit, right, it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that the Holy Spirit has given us. So that means you have to have received the Holy Spirit to, to have that self-control within you. You can't do it on your own. Um, many people think that uh, taking on a new diet or um, turning down a habit or, or whatever it is, they can just have this mental strength and they're a strong person and they can just do it, but you have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish those things. Number two, self-discipline prepares you. Luke 16 10, 12. You guys are going to get out early tonight. It says, <laughs> it says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. Eh, let me read up there. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Self-discipline prepares you. We read right there in Scripture that if you cannot be trusted with little, he's not going to give you much. You know, you hear quotes like, the rich get richer. No, I would say that the disciplined get blessed. You know, if you can prove that you are going to be a good steward of the, of the things that he's given you, then you will be given more. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Tammy and Pastor Todd talk about how in ministry, you know, they've gone from, from scrubbing the bathrooms to vacuuming the sanctuary to children's ministry to youth ministry. They've done the whole thing. And they prove to God each step of the way that their, their faithfulness, their faithfulness from when... Um, they first took over this ministry, and there were 23 people there seven, eight years ago. And they proved that they were just going to be as faithful to those 23, and they were going to give them everything they had to those 23, just like they do the 400 now. Their faithfulness has not changed. And because God saw that within them, he's blessed them with more, and he will do the exact same thing for you. If you show him that you are going to be faithful with the gifts and things that he's given you, he's going to give you more. And you may sit there and say, you know what? I don't have a lot of material possessions, and I feel like I've, I've done right, and I've been faithful, and I've been a good steward of those things. Maybe your time is on the way. Maybe it's coming, but God has given you other gifts besides material possessions, a gift, a calling, um, maybe not to preach or speak, maybe to teach, maybe to be nurturing, maybe to, to reach out to people in need with a, a thank you card or, or something like that. God has blessed each and every one of us with some type of gift, as you give that back to him and you, and you do it faithfully, he's going to let that grow. Um, I think about when I was a kid, you know, if, if mom gave me 20 bucks and I just went out and it like dissolved and I'm spinning, didn't know what it was on. And I said, hey, mom, I need 20 bucks. She's going to say, I just gave it to you yesterday. What have you done? Same thing with our paychecks. You know, if we get our paychecks on Friday and it's like gone, you know, I can't sit there and say, hey, God, I need you to bless me with a better job. What you spend your money on? No, I went out to Applebee's and went to a movie. You know what I mean? Just proving that you're a good steward. Um, One of God's principles for advancement is the requirement to be diligent with what we have and where we are before he will advance us. To prove that we're going to be diligent, we're going to be disciplined, we're going to be faithful in the things that he has already given us, then God can advance us. That may, again, be in a ministry with a gift, with a calling, with finances, with your kids, with, with whatever you want to put with your job. Um, we're all quick, I think, to want a promotion, but prove that you're faithful where you're at, and God will promote you. Um, this 
principle is, is illustrated in two parables, same chapter. Uh, we're going to do Matthew 25, 14. I'll probably try to read through it pretty quickly. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Next slide. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold, of, of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your, of your master's happiness. Then the man who, who had received one bag of gold, Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I had not sown and gathered where I, where I had not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. I'll stop right there. There you can see, man who had five bags, was a good steward of it, handled it, was disciplined with it, didn't squander it, he was given five more. The man with two bags, same thing, good steward, God gave him, or well, the master gave him two more. The person with one squandered it, didn't do, didn't do anything with it. And what did, what did he do? He took the bag from him and gave it to the one who had 10 bags. You're thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why the guy with 10 bags? Because he's proven that he was a good steward, that he was going to be disciplined with the resources and the things that God, the gifts that God, the master, had given him. The same thing is true with us. I won't read all of this one, but there's the next verse. It, well, sorry, it's before that. It's um, Matthew 25, 1 and 3. And that's the parable of the 10 virgins. And in that parable, it talks about these ten virgins who are, who are waiting for the, the, the bridal party. They're waiting for the bridegroom to appear. And, you know, you didn't know the day. You didn't know the time. You didn't know the hour. And it's a perfect analogy of when, if, when God, Jesus Christ, is going to come and, and, and save us. Um, but you didn't know that. And so you had to always be ready. You had to be disciplined. You had to be ready for that moment when it was going to happen. And in that parable, you have five virgins who, who had oil in their lamps. You had the other five who did not keep oil in their lamps. And when t the time came and, and um, the bridegroom came, the ones who didn't have oil, oil were scrambling. And they were trying to find it and trying to get it. And you can go back and read the story. And uh, they were just kind of out of luck. And so we have to be prepared. We have to be ready. We have to be disciplined and, and on point for when that time comes. Okay, number three. Self-discipline requires training. Self-discipline requires training. Think along the lines of like martial arts or ballet even. You know, my, my little daughter just started her first ballet class and she is so excited. And Montana uh, did it as well when she was younger. And um, so we're, we're, she's just so cute. And so when she first starts her first ballet class, she's not ready to be a prima ballerina, right? It's going to take time. It's going to take work. It's going to take practice. It's going to take discipline. The first person, when they go to, uh, to learn martial arts, their first day there, they're not ready to be a black belt. No, they call it a discipline. Why? Because you have to train your mind. You have to train your body. You have to train for stuff like that. I'm a golfer, and so I heard uh, a story about Gary Player, who's one of the all-time greats. And um, this was back in his youth, and he was playing, and he, he had people say this to them all the time. And he finally, I guess, got fed up because there was a guy who said to him, man, I would do anything just to be able to hit the golf ball like you can. And he looks back at him and he goes, no, you wouldn't. 
Because if you would, you would wake up in the morning, hit a thousand golf balls, go back, tape up your bleeding hands, go hit a thousand more, and you do it all again the next day. You wouldn't do anything that you could to hit the golf ball like I can. Because it takes discipline, it takes training. And so uh, we can learn about this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. This is Paul, and um, he's referring how he's kind of doing everything that he can to, to minister and evangelize and reach out to the Jews, the Greeks, the people that are around him. And um, he says, Do you not know in a, that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like... I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. And when he talks about striking a blow to his body, when I went back and was researching this and reading it, he's talking about his mind and, and being able to, to be disciplined enough in his mind to do this. Um, it, you know, you talk about runners running hard for a race to, to win a prize, and those times, it's kind of like the Olympic times when it was first starting and um, how their crown or their, their trophy wasn't like a trophy that you get today that, you know, like your parents will keep forever. It was, it was a wreath. And um, apparently what it says is that the, the leaves would wilt by the next day. So it's literally gone. And so um, to be able to train and to run this race that we're in requires discipline. Just like if you were a world-class athlete, it takes practice. Um, he referenced a boxer. A boxer trains to absorb blows to their body, to, to keep, you know, they, they do enough um, endurance, stamina, cardio type stuff so that their legs are underneath them in the 12th round. And I'm afraid what we have done in the church is that we like to watch sports, but we don't want to be athletes. We like to come and watch the preacher speak and, and, and watch the praise team praise, but we don't want to be as active participants. We don't want to train. We don't want to, to put in all of the hard work that it takes um, to get there. And so um, what, I'm, what I hope is not happening is, you know, a, a marathon. We're talking about a runner. A marathon is 26 miles, right, 26 point something. I'm worried that so many people are training for let's say 13 miles, and they reach the halfway mark, and they just kind of fizzle out. Or maybe they're, you know, like, think of like a boxer, to use that analogy. I think there's like 12 rounds in a boxing match, and maybe through five rounds, you know, you're, you're socking it to the devil. You're giving it to him. You're pumped up. You're amped up. But because you haven't put in the required discipline, the, the required training, um, come the sixth, seventh round, your, your legs are getting weak, and he can just deliver a b blow to knock you out. You know, I've seen so many people that um, come to Christ and they're, they're hyped up, they're excited, they're there all the time and they're studying, but then they kind of fall by the wayside and you don't see them anymore. That's because this isn't a non-participatory non um, relationship, right, with Christ. It's something that requires self-discipline, self-control, um, some training to put into that. And again, to reference Hebrews 12, 11, it's, you know, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those that have been trained by it. Okay, last point, number four. Self-discipline is necessary for making good choices. All right, cool. I'm going to do a little illustration. I'm going to use you guys as my volunteers. Please come forward. Put them on the spot. All right, if you could put up Galatians 5, uh, let's go ahead and do 17 through 23. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another. With one another. And remember, if we have the Holy Spirit, um, the gift, a gift of the spirit is self-control. Um, so, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, 
hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So self-discipline is necessary. Self-control is necessary for making good choices. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have that fruit, right, to do those things. And, and I've always said that decisions in inches can result in being miles apart. So if you think about, I don't know, if you shooting a gun, for instance, if you're aiming this way, and the guy on the left aims an inch that way, the guy on the right aims an inch that way, they're going to end up really far apart, though it's only a matter of inches. And so for my example, if you two gentlemen would come over here, we'll stick you here, and you here. So how many of you all have known people that maybe they grew up together, maybe they were your friend, Maybe you did a lot of the same things. You, maybe it was a sibling. You were raised by the same parents and the same principles, um, the, the same teaching from, from your parents, and, but you both ended up in completely different directions, right? Because of a couple bad choices. They, maybe someone didn't exhibit the right self-control. They didn't do the right things. And so, and so we'll think about three or four decisions. So these two people, similar, same, same area they grew up in, same family type, should be on the same path. They should end up at the, at the same destination. But this person over here was walking, and they made a bad decision. They did something they weren't supposed to do, smoked something, drank something, and that got them started going this way. So hey, they're going that path. You can stop there. This person over here, you know, both of these people started off, they, you know, they were wanting to do the right thing and serve God. But this person just said, you know what, I'm not going to get involved in that crowd. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to do all the right things. So they started off opposite, and now they're going the different directions. And this guy, instead of recoursing and coming back, he said, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to make another bad decision. I'm going to, I'm going to make another, just one more bad decision. This person over here says, you know what? I'm going to get involved in, a, in like a, a Bible study or a men's group, or uh, I'm going to just get involved in ministry. I'm going to do something to, to do it even further. I'm going to train even harder, and I'm going to go this direction. And so long story short, you can see how just a couple bad choices can get you going on the wrong path, right? All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it. No, you weren't going to fight. The whole illustration of that is, is just to show that we don't put a lot of thought sometimes in the things that we do and the places we go and the things we see, but they can have real long-term lasting impacts on our lives and, and then where we end up. And just like the reference of Paul in Galatians, and, and I'm kind of closing up. You can play music if you'd like. Um, just, just like in, in Paul in Galatians, he was talking about running a race or, or, or like a boxer. Every single person in here is running a race. We're all in it. I hope, I hope that we're all in it to win it, like it said in Galatians. That we're all running to get that prize, right? That we're giving it all we have. We're willing to do what it takes. We're, real, we're willing to be disciplined. We're willing to exhibit that self-control. We're, we're willing to do whatever we have to do to make sure that we finish at that finish line. You know, Paul tells us to finish well. But we read in the Bible that it says that we are on a narrow path, right? With a narrow gate. You think about a marathon or an ultra marathon, let's say 50, 100 miles, whatever, more people start that race than what finish it. And my prayer, my hope, is that the people that are in here, all of you, are ones who, who finish that race. And you're not going to get there just by doing the cultural norms of just going to church a couple days a week. You're going to get there by digging in deep, by training like you're an athlete, an Olympic athlete, by reading your Bible, by, by seeking God's face, by surrounding yourself with, with good people. This, again, this is a participatory relationship. Sometimes I look at other religions, um, we'll, we'll say Mormons or Hindus or, or Islamics, and not to give them like credit, but they're disciplined in their pursuit after their God. 
and, and, and Mormons in here by a long list of things that they feel will make them closer to God. But we just kind of cast God to the, to the wayside in our lives. We don't always make him the priority. We don't always seek him. We don't always do the things that would bring us closer to him. In fact, a lot of times we do the opposite because we don't feel we have time or we don't have the opportunities. We don't carve out time or make time to seek him because it's a secondary act. But all of us are in that race. And it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So no matter where you are today, you can still get right back on the course and keep driving and we'll keep running. And so if you would, I'd just like to offer the opportunity if you would close your eyes and bow your head. If you are in a position where maybe you haven't started the race, maybe you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your, into your heart as your Savior, and that is something that you want to do, just raise your hand. Maybe you would say that, you know what, I was once running the race, but I have gone off course. I've gone off the narrow path. I haven't done the things that I, you know, planned to do, wanted to do, said I would do. I haven't pursued God like I was supposed to. And tonight I want to to get back on track and, and to run harder than I've ever ran before. If that's you, just raise your hand. As they play, I'm just going to pray really, really quickly over everyone. And after that, uh, feel free to dismiss. God, thank you for loving us. Loving us so intently and, and, and loving us so deeply that no matter where we are, where we've been, or what we've gone through, um, you still pursue us and you still um, reach for us, God. I thank you for the people in this room and for those that have have never accepted um, you into their hearts. Um, if they could just repeat this prayer, prayer after me and just say, Father God, I accept you into my life as my Lord and Savior. I accept what you did on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving me for my sins. I repent from my sins and I turn to you. And for those that have said that they want to recommit or, or get back on track and be disciplined in their race and pursuing you, uh, I pray for them that you would give them strength, that you would give them endurance, that you would give them stamina to run the race that's before them. And God, we just thank you for who you are, for what you mean to us, for your greatness, for your glory, and we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys